A special series in UT San Diego has been documenting the financial and emotional toll of so-called frequent flyers to San Diego's emergency rooms. They are the patients who visit the ER several times a year and in some cases several times a week. In a moment we'll speak with the reporters who spent months working on this story but first here's a video clip from their series. In San Diego a small group of men and women used the 911 system in a way that it was never intended as a means of primary health care. This group is less than 1% of the population, yet it accounts for more than 17% of all ambulance and paramedic calls in the city, leaving large public costs in its wake. Think of the resources that were taken away from other people. Think of the wear and tear on everything in this city, every kind of infrastructure you can imagine, police, fire, ambulances. Think about what it did to the waiting times of people that have legitimate problems in the, in the emergency department. Just the frustration levels of the nurses, the doctors, and everybody who's taking care of somebody for a condition that they took care of them a week ago. Looking at this population as an example, Dr. Dunford feels that there are answers to something much larger. The population I'm talking about is the worst of the worst. And I'm talking about finding fixes for those people. There's a wake effect that will extend across the entire healthcare system and we can solve those problems. This story will take you alongside first responders and inside the emergency room where you will see how the disconnect between prevention and care has expanded the burdens on the system and the cost to the public. Joining me now are John Gonzalez with the Center for Health Reporting and James Gregg. He's a video journalist with UT San Diego. Thank you both for being here. Oh, thanks for having us. So the video sets up the problem, but tell mm -hmm. us more about who these people are, the 1% using these services. Mm -hmm. It's actually eight hundredths of a percent, technically. Um, these are folks who are the toughest cases in the uh, healthcare system in a lot of ways. They're folks who are on track to use our call 911 at least six times in the course of a year. Most people might do that one or two times their whole life. Um, though they're a small percentage of the city, they account for um, over 17% of all paramedic and ambulance calls in the city. So are they the homeless population, the indigent? Are they the sickest population? Who are they? You know, there are a few things. They are very sick. They are very sick. Um, most of them suffer from chronic ailments that many of us suffer from, um, diabetes, um, hypertension, um, some of them have uh, liver disease, but there's also a lot of hard bark there. Um, there's folks who are mentally ill, um, folks who cope with substance abuse. So James, you shot the video, you took these photos. Uh, some of them are just amazing, and, and I wondered when I was looking at them on your website, how did you get these people to agree to have their photo taken and, and agree to be in this video? Um, every, everybody's an individual, and so I think that uh, for each of them it was it was different, but mostly they're just people. And so I think that you, just by being a person yourself and being very open and kind to people and honest, um, there was quite a lot of participation, actually. I didn't get told no, no a lot. And you capture moments of really, you know, I think one of your stories talks about the worst day mm -hmm. or one of the worst days of their lives, being in this situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, John, you mentioned, you, you talked about some of the statistics. Do mm -hmm. we know how much all of this costs? Um, a rough estimate just for uh, 911 calls, just for paramedic and ambulance charges, is uh, $20 million in the course of a year. Um, we don't have a solid number in terms of ER costs. There's some debate as to whether, as to um, the kind of technical way you bill those things, but those costs are substantial also. And then there's, um, there can be jail cost. Um, other costs inherent in um, tracking these people um, on a social level. Now, in today's story in UT San Diego, you point out that um, a high percent, most in fact, of these people have insurance. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, most of them have insurance of the public variety, um, which is a distinction, but they do have insurance. And part of the problem is, is that uh, Medi-Cal, that's basically Medicaid, we just call it Medi-Cal here. Um, basically, you gotta wait an awful long time to, to first of all, apply for it, reapply for it each year, and when you're in it, you do have to wait an awful lot of long time for an appointment, but so do people with private insurance. 
And that's one of the reasons the ER has become a viable alternative for a lot of folks. In the video, you, uh, you mentioned the disconnect, though, between mm -hmm. preventative care and sort of ending up in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, many of us know, like you say, we mm -hmm. have to wait for a doctor's appointment. Is this just, um, you know, people not taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. um, not in a position to perhaps take care of themselves, mm -hmm. and, and not being able to sort of make that appointment wait two weeks. I mean, is it just a completely different situation? Or? The population that we pro profile was primarily homeless. Um, so, the, uh, you know, um, depending on your point of view, you might think that they are unwilling to take care of themselves. We met a lot of people who were unable to take care of themselves as well. So it's a mix. James, was there someone you met or a particular moment in, because in, you spent months documenting all of this that really kind of hit home for you, the one that kind of summed up the story? Yeah, um, a gentleman named uh, Raul Hirsch for, for me, well, I mean, not just him, but um, I think that he's the one that kind of grabbed me the most because I spent a lot of time with him. And getting a chance to try to really understand where he's coming from in this whole phenomenon of going back and forth. He ended up, uh, since we began the story, he's been in the emergency room over 70 times and he's been in jail twice. And uh, a, a not really nice guy, I really enjoyed being around him, but just trying to uh, understand how he could just continue to go through this cycle over and over again and very predictably, where he would sleep outside most of the time and if he felt like it, he would just go to the ER. Sometimes he would have legitimate injuries, and he was, he was in the ICU twice, at least, I think, um, with head trauma. And, uh, and trying to understand what he wants out of his experience and what he's really trying for. Uh, I don't know that I ever understood it, but he's, it was very contradictory because he would be intelligent and engaged and talk about goals that he has, and then at other times it would be, be that those cares weren't there in quite the same way. Well, I know there's so much more to all of this on the website, at the UT San Diego website, as well as um, a continuing series. There's more to come tomorrow and the day after. James and John, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you.